I might have to go outside that wall. Or you can have um, just <laughs> those mics or handheld. Or which ones? Whatever you prefer. Whatever you prefer. We've got handheld. We have got the table mics over there as yeah. well. But... Bring a table mic over as well and then we'll see how it goes. Right, good morning everyone. How are you all? You're looking very bright and breezy. Um, can, you, can everyone hear me okay at the back? The mic's working. Great. Okay, well welcome everyone. Um, so we've got an interesting couple of hours with each other. If, the mic, if this works, which it doesn't. <laughs> Let's try again. Is it on? It's the next one. It's that one. It's that one. Not that one. That one. That one. Yeah. Ah, right, okay, there we go. Technology works. So, um, welcome everyone. Uh, we've got uh, an interesting um, morning, as I said, ahead of us. Um, the Leadership Network, as you know, is about the top 100 managers in the organisation. Uh, you're absolutely critical to the performance of the organisation and how it works. And, of course, for most of the time, we're very much into delivering our services to our clients and to our customers. Um, but for many of you, and certainly for me, a lot of our work involves us um, working with our political leadership, the 54 councillors who are actually the council. We, we are not the council, we're just the, the, um, the labour force, really, and the management team that uh, helps deliver things. Um, so uh, our focus today on, on the, in the leadership network in developing our leadership skills is going to be talking a bit about how do we operate in a political environment. And of course, as many of you know, that's very timely because we've got the local elections in May 2015. Now, in terms of um, uh, how we're going to structure this morning, you will have noticed that we have three very important guests with us this morning. Uh, and I'm <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really delighted that we've got uh, Councillor Dan Yates, Councillor Fiona McCafferty and Councillor Tony Janio uh, to join us. Um, many of you will have worked with them and spoken with them, but some of you may not have that much experience of working with members. And um, they've been really generous with their time uh, to say that they're going to come on and talk a little bit about their own individual experiences. Not so much about what their party political platform is, but just their experience as um, politicians and as members. And really some, perhaps we can draw out from them some of their expectations from what they would like to see from us as um, lead managers as lead organisational um, leaders in the, in the organisation. And of course that's going to become very important because um, we're likely to have something like 50% new councillors joining the council after May. Quite a lot of very experienced councillors who are standing down. Obviously some may not be successful as candidates in the election, but we, we estimate around about 50% might be s standing down. So, so um, Dan, Tony and Freedom are going to talk for sort of five, ten minutes each. Um, we're going to give you a bit of time then just to reflect on what you've heard and have a little discussion on your tables. And then there's going to be an opportunity to ask um, questions. And, and you know, they, our, our politicians are giving of their time. It's, then, this is not a political um, question time about what do they think about Brexit or what do they think about um, state of the economy or anything else. This is about... You're going, yeah. It's about you know, their role as politicians um, and their personal experiences and what they would like to see from us. We're then um, going to, uh, after that, we're going to talk a little bit about our own um, election planning um, uh, for May 2015. Um, we've rehearsed some of that previously, but we're going to get a presentation and update um, from uh, Abraham and Claire and Mark Wall about what, uh, where we are in terms of our planning for the election. Um, myself and ELT are very much concerned to say that um, a political transition from one council to a new council after May, regardless of which political party is in control, that is a thing in itself. 
Um, and it's very important, I think, that we support all our politicians from all the parties in going through that period. Um, I know we, some of us are looking forward to the PERDA periods because we think that um, our lives go a little bit quieter, but for, um, for these people, their lives get incredibly busy. But the, count, the business of the council doesn't stop. So it is, it is a really interesting period in which um, we operate, and it's very important that we are professional in our role and we help our staff understand that. So we'll be talking about that towards the end. And then lastly, we'll just be having a bit of a group discussion on what we've pulled out from today, uh, any further development we think we might need, and we'll see how we go from there. So without further ado, unless there's any questions from anyone, um, we'll move on. And um, I'm going to ask our first speaker, uh, Councillor Dan Yates, to um, start us off. Dan. Absolutely. Can everyone hear me? Is that working? Okay, so I've been asked to cover two things this morning. Firstly, what do I need from the council's management team? And that means, that means you, um, just, to, just to clarify that. And also, what would have helped me when I first became a councillor? Um, medication, probably. <clears throat> but let's talk, about, let's talk about what we need from, from the council's management team. In terms of what I need is, is support and expertise. You know, councillors are not, you know, whether, whether they're leader of the council or a newly elected councillor, councillors are not elected on the basis of expertise. We don't live in a meritocracy. We live in a, we live in a democracy. So somebody could be walking in as the new leader of the council, you know, on May the 3rd or May the 4th, depending on how quickly democratic services and electoral services get all of the everything sorted out, and have no understanding at all of the council, you know, completely, a completely blank page. I'm hoping that's not going to happen, uh, but that's, that's the risk. You know, all, all three of us are up for election, just like the rest of the 53 councillors. There'll be 54 councillors who will all have a mandate, and they'll all be there to be able to, you know, sort of hopefully influence what the council does in line with the mandate that they've got from their, from their electors. And in my case, that'll be electors in Morscombe and Bevendine. So what I, what I need from you is to be able to rely on the stuff that you're paid to do, that you come to work to do, that you're appointed to do, you know, and that you're doing now, you'll be doing during Perda, and you'll be doing whatever colour and flavour the, the council is in the future. You know, it's to bring that professional expertise and experience and knowledge and understanding and integrity and professionalism to the role to help me to look like or whoever is leader of the council and whoever the councillors are to look like they know what they're doing. Uh, because ideally, we want them to know what they're doing. Okay, because good decision making, and that's really what the politicians are elected for, is to, do this, is to do a little bit of steering and choreography of the council, is about having some level of understanding and understanding the implication of the decisions that, that are going to be taken. Now hopefully, there won't be 54 people who've got no idea about what the council does and how it works. It's possible, there might be some, there always are. You know, there are always some that are more experienced and some that are less experienced. You know, I I've previously was a councillor before I was elected in 2015, so that helped me a little bit, but that was a district council and it was tiny. And coming to a big, you know, sort of a big authority, you know, sort of that's got a much broader scope of services was a significant challenge for me. Uh, to understand those, because previously it was just stuff that I looked at, like transport and education, and I just went, "Oh, that's the stuff the county council does," you know. But to actually understand that that's part of a, you know, sort of an integrated, unitary delivery is was tricky, you know. And I was lucky as well that I, I can understand numbers a little bit. So, so, so some of the spreadsheets and the things that got thrown at me didn't completely freak me out. But for some councillors, even those that are very experienced, it still does. Okay, councillors aren't experts, they're representatives of the people and, and just like the people who are walking past Hove Town Hall today, some of them might know a lot, some of them might know less, some of them might know nothing about what goes in this building and they're only interested in can they get to, I don't know, Cafe Nero, you know, and get, get to the head of the queue and get a coffee and get back to what they do normally, which for some of them will be very high level professional work, for some of them they may not, they may not have any other work or any other activity never engaged with council services, although they will have done, obviously, they've been to school, 
you know, they use the transport network, they're walking in the streets, they're, hopefully they're paying council tax, it's a requirement, so we need to make sure they do pay council tax, otherwise they get, they get dropped as councillors pretty quickly. But saying that, there is absolutely no way any councillor can know everything that you all know. You know, let alone, you know, the stuff that you know and you're dealing with now would overwhelm any councillor, let alone all of the knowledge and the expertise that you bring from your previous roles and your knowledge of what you've done over previous years. So it's very much a supportive role. I can't do anything useful. I can't make good decisions as a councillor without the expertise and the information coming through to me so that, so that I'm given the range of options and I'm given an understanding about what the implications of those options are. Similarly, you can't do anything if we don't make decisions. And you'll be really angry about the things that you might be being asked to do if we make really bad decisions because we haven't been informed. So it's a, it's a symbiotic relationship. You know, sort of we, we need to get the stuff from you out of your heads into very long, sometimes unwieldy reports, but then into our heads and into our decision-making process so that as a, as a group of 54 councillors, we do the right thing, or we do the best thing, or we make the best decision possible. You know, I'm not going to talk about the party politics of it. Obviously, each party, you know, sort of councillors come in with their own set of ideals and beliefs and principles and philosophies that they're wanting to introduce. And depending on, after May the 2nd, whether we end up with majority control or another minority-led administration, is going to make a difference as to how much of each individual manifesto or set of principles gets delivered in the end over the course of the next four years and how much of it you know, might get forgotten until the next four years and, then, and another set of elections and, and manifestos. Obviously, I'm hoping that there'll be a Labour majority administration. It would be the first time in 20 years that the city had chosen. Yeah, yeah no, the, ci the city will make a choice. It hasn't really been very consistent over its choices for the last 20 years. I think everyone knows that. I can't pretend that that's, a that's anything other than how things are. But things could be different, you know, so it could be much simpler. But at the same time, it's also the job of councillors. You know, some of those 54 will always be trying to hold the administration to account, acting as a check and balance. They need information too to be able to do that. At the moment, going through the budget process, they need a lot of information that's around being able to hold the budget to account, to challenge the budget, to improve the budget. Because we are in a minority position, you know, it can't just be one group of councillors that wear one colour rosette at election time that take all of the decisions and force everything through. It's about, it's about collective responsibility. All of the councillors have responsibility for the budget setting and w they will all be trying to make sure that it's the best budget that they see, that they see possible. Or at least let's hope that. If, if that's not the case, let me know now, Tony, and, and I'll prepare for the second budget meeting on the following Tuesday and all sorts of shenanigans in between. Now, yeah, no, I've booked it in and I've told all of my councillors to book it in as well because, to be honest, politics can be a very good thing, okay, in that it gives some direction to the council. It doesn't just mean that the council's a massive bureaucracy that's just getting on and doing its own thing. It means that there is some consistent understanding of what, of what the public... Or should expect from decision making but actually at this point in time elections tend to mean that politics does have a stronger influence on decisions that are made in the city so this will inevitably as a budget as a budget round be more difficult to get to a decision than previous years that's that's just life but actually at the end of the day I can live with that because it doesn't make too much grief for many of you in the room, some people excluded. Dave, Dave and Nigel are definitely going to be a little bit busy over the budget setting process. But we need everybody to understand that that is just part of what goes on. That's part of the difficulty of having democracy, is that it does sometimes create you know, sort of hiatuses of, of, of difficult activity that's going on. Once the budget's set, we can get back to the, the job of delivering the budget and regardless of anything else the day-to-day -day work carries on you know services don't shut down it's not like the US where services shut down until a budget's agreed and finances are agreed you know we have to deliver everything 365 days a year you know whether there's an election whether there's a budget it's all carrying on so in terms of 
what I would have, what would have helped me when I first became a counsellor would have been to understand, if I've got a question, which one of you do I ask? You know, who do I, who do I ask? Who do I go to? How do I find that bit of information that I need that's going to help me make sense of the, th the problem that I've got? And whether that's a problem about a decision that needs to be taken, whether it's a problem about understanding a complicated report that's coming to me, or whether it's a problem about an individual piece of casework. You know, when councillors are first elected, you know, I know councillors that were getting emails, you know, the day they were elected, and people contacting them saying, I've got this problem with housing. You know, well, how do you know who to ask? You know, there's no, there is no map, there is no easy way to do it. I would have loved to have known the stuff that I knew after, after six weeks or six months on that first day. That would have been absolutely brilliant. And I only got that information by, partly by trial and error, sending out random emails to people I thought might be able to help, usually on the basis of what does it say on their name tag. You know, so, so if, if it was housing, eventually I should have worked out that I might want to contact Larissa about it. Um, and, I, and that really, if I'm contacting Dave about it, I've, I'm, I'm heading down the wrong route. Um, but there are some really useful resources within the council that we just need to understand a bit more. You know, where there are emails that are specifically set up for councillors to use, it would be really good for councillors to know that and to understand that. It's really good to flag up the basics that when you're reading a report, there is a contact officer written on the front of that report, and maybe you might want to contact them. I didn't realise that when I was... It, it, I kind of skimmed over that front bit and was looking for decisions and information, and it took me a while to realise, oh, hold on, maybe if I contact the person that's actually written the report, they might know something about it, you know, even if they have only been responsible for bringing it all together. I'd have loved to have been presented with a map that actually showed me where does the council operate in the city. Okay, because I didn't know all of the individual buildings, I didn't know in all of the individual services. So to know where IT were based would have been really helpful. You know, compared to, you know, sort of where finance are based and the different parts of finance or audit, you know, to understand where people operated within, within the buildings, but also to be, be able to understand who relates to who. Because looking around these tables, although I can see some people have, you know, sort of working relationship links, because I understand who most of the people are, you're not necessarily all in the same place. And we don't get a clear structure chart of how everyone works. I'd have loved to have known that on the wave, I could look at someone's email address and that I can go in by taking their name and I can work out who they report to and who that person reports to and who that person reports to and therefore what directorate they're in. That, that stuff like that is fantastic now. And I've told all of my, all of my prospective councillors about that because it's a really useful resource. When I get an email for, from somebody who may be a more junior member of staff, you know, somebody who it might not be appropriate for me to just be going back to and chasing and, and, and asking questions to, it's useful for me to be able to know who their manager is and, and to pick somebody at the right level to speak to and to ask about that. The other thing that I would have really, really liked to have known is the key email addresses, the key directions to go to. Who are, you know, who are the best people to ask? Now, I have to say, my fellow councillors quickly said to me, don't bother asking that person if you've got that problem, ask that person. And it wasn't because they were saying somebody's particularly unhelpful or never answers their emails or, you know, sort of, or only comes in once a month just to check everything and to deal with everything. It was actually them saying, that per you know, this person is really responsive and is a problem solver, you know, and because that's part of their role. So to know who solves problems when you're a counsellor, because all you end up faced with is lots of problems, would be a really helpful thing. But mostly, like I say, what we need you to do is to, is to use your skills, use your experience. You know, bring that to us. You know, we're never going to be doing your job. You're never going to be doing our job. Not at the same time, at least. Yeah? But it's really good to be able to share. And that's, that, and that's my key message, is about, is about we have to share what's inside our heads. I tell you my problems, you tell me that your solutions. That's life, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you.
How are you? Can everyone hear me? Is that okay? Yeah, brilliant. Um, first of all, thank you to Felicity, Jeff, and all of you for the kind invitation um, to the meeting today, and I look forward to listening to some of your contributions as well. This isn't just a one-way conversation. Um, secondly, uh, and on behalf of the Green Group of Councillors, I want to thank each and every one of you for all the work that you're doing for the City Council. Um, Councillors, I don't think say it, don't say it often enough, but thank you very much um, for everything that you're doing. Um, and at this intense period for public sector workers, quite frankly, some of the things you're being asked to do that were in the local authority bread and butter not that long ago um, seemingly require minor miracles at the moment. Um, so thank you. Um, one of the things that I have been doing with our candidates in preparation for the 2nd of May elections is asking them um, how they're going to prepare for an environment where things seen as core business only a matter of months ago don't exist. I've asked them with thinking about how they will succeed for residents despite the environment that we're all in at the moment. And I could probably ask you all the same thing. Um, so as Deputy Leader of the Council, I've been Chair of the Planning Committee and now obviously as a leader in opposition, I've worn many different hats on this authority. Um, but the two things that stick out for me in terms of what I need from you are consistency and clarity. Um, the yardstick for me of what a good local authority officer is, is no matter who you are, if I'm an administration councillor, an opposition councillor, um, council officers who treat you exactly the same are the best ones. Um, so not being a weather vane and telling me how things are is really important. And I think that that's really important because I'm more than likely going to be the one telling residents about what's going on. Um, the, the writer of The Great Gatsby, not a book I particularly like, um, F. Scott Fitzgerald, um, he once wrote that one should be able to see that things are hopeless, yet be determined to make them otherwise. And I think at moments uh, like the current period that that could be the sort of unofficial motto for local government. Um, and I think, I think that's, that's one of the key things that we have to do together, is that actually things pre look pretty rough, but actually together, whether it's our feet in the community or the, the hard work that you're doing in, in the buildings, that actually together we're able to do something for people and provide them with some hope as well. Um, obviously, our jobs collectively are public-facing, and I think that means that we have to be jointly obsessed with visibly delivering value for money for things that seem relevant to people's lives. Um, and we know from residents, um, through things like the annual satisfaction survey, um, that we still have a lot of work to do. And that survey that came in just before Christmas was saying that people in the city are not so satisfied with what the council's doing. That's really hard as well. Um, I would also appeal to you um, that the mantra about customers, it's not a word I particularly like, um, it only works if we're a supermarket, and we're not a supermarket. Um, residents are fundamentally the people who pay our salaries, and they expect us to do our best for them, and I think that's a mission that we're all jointly on together. In terms of understanding you to enable, to, to enable a greater understanding of each other, I would say that what would have helped me when I was first elected was a clearer understanding of the different roles, similar to what Dan has been saying. Please try and understand our job. Um, I won't forget easily working in two separate London boroughs uh, and their different approaches to councillors. In one, I was told the councillors don't matter. And in the other, um, I was told to ignore them, um, <laughs> which, which I think is quite funny. Um, we're not just other managers, and as Jeff has outlined, we are, of course, technically, God forbid, your employer. Um, Equally, we don't always get on, and that's okay. We often don't agree with one another, and that's okay. I think all of the group leaders recognize that with many new councillors due to join the authority in May, we have more work uh, to do on helping you understand us better. One of my other jobs is that I sit on the executive committee of the local government association. I'm also a peer and a mentor for the LGA as well. And one of the great things that you get to do when you're doing peer work is you're able to look at local authorities all over the country 
and some of the things that I would really focus on there are the relationships between officers and members. It won't come as a complete shock to those of you who followed the tragic events in Nottinghamshire County Council, the local authority that went bankrupt and had uh, commissioners sent in, that historically speaking, the relationship between the equivalent of Dave as finance lead and members was historically really, really poor. And that's something that I think we should really take on board in terms of trying to understand each other and keep those relationships good, even when, and especially when, we don't agree with one another. Um, I also fully appreciate that in a room with a plethora of wide-ranging skills, um, whether that's your management, whether that's your professional expertise that you bring to this organisation, um, that that means that some of the time you're focused on those professional skills, and that's great. But don't forget that councillors also are able to look across the organisation, um, not least because of the committees we sit on or the constituency work that we do on our behalf of our residents. We're, we're sort of dip in, dipping in and out um, of all the different silos, and that means that we very quickly build up um, a bit of a profile across the organisation. So that's another thing that I would ask us to draw into the, the conversations as we go forward. Um, one of the things that was first mentioned to me when I was elected eight years ago was how we were going to break out of silos. Um, and I think there's an awful lot of work to do still on that. And we are doing more on that. And I think we're being more effective on that today. But in my opinion, um, one of the unintended consequences of austerity, literally there are fewer people working for the authority, has been that people don't have the opportunities uh, so freely available to them to be as proactive about working for the entire council. And that is, again, another thing I would really like us to do together. Um, it's, not all, uh, it's not all gloomy, though. And I think that, that the key thing that we need to focus on is delivery. Um, and I think the, the other thing that we need to focus on is, is what way decisions are being understood, both in terms of the professional skills that you draw to bear on the work of the council and then what we're doing in our communities to represent the council. Um, and I draw you to a comment from a former Speaker of the House of Representatives from the 1970s, and he said how all politics is local. And I think that's, um, I think that's right today, whether that's the work and the professional skills that you bring to bear in terms of what's happening in our parks, or a licensing application, or planning, or adult social care, or city clean, uh, culture, the, the list is endless. Um, I think we're incredibly lucky to live in such an amazing place. I think some of the time we forget that. Um, that's councillors as well as, as, well as council staff. Um, I think part of our job in terms of representing such an amazing place, it's a great place to be elected to represent. It's, a, it's an honour, I think. Um, and I, I think we, we have to have a better way of talking about what a great place it is that we live in. Um, I think where I'll end up, though, is that confidence is still with us as councillors and as council officers. And actually, if you look at the surveys that have now been done for the last number of years, by the local government association, they tell us very clear things about how you and I are understood. And I think that's, that's one thing that we can really focus on in terms of a positive. So their survey of just over a 1,000 adults um, that they've been doing for the last few years, they asked who did those 1,000 adults most trust when it came to local decision making? Did they trust their local council or the government 71% of them said their local council. Only 15% said the government. Um, in the same way, the most trusted group by far on making good local decisions was local councillors with 69%. Only 13% of respondents said they trusted members of parliament. And I think those things tell us some quite clear things about the fact that we're trusted uh, and that people want to come with us. And I think I'll leave it there in terms of the sort of, um, the sort of adventure that, that we need to, the, the challenge and the adventure that, that, we need to jointly, uh, that we need to jointly do in the next period. Thank you.
Um, and then after Tony's spoken, we'll have a few minutes just to reflect on what people have said. So, Tony, over to you. Thank you. Hello, Wembley. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, well, the, just to start, really, the, um, the first thing I did as a true and trusted counsellor is I looked at the two questions and I ignored them completely. So um, I think you've all, um, you've all probably faced that in your times dealing with counsellors. So let's not talk about... Those, let's, let's do something else. And I think the, the one thing as a leader, you have to, um, you've got to deal with Dan, Phil, and myself. It could be any of us next. Um, Tere Blessed Teresa's over in, uh, we might get a Brexit deal today, so you never know. Don't put money on it. Um, but so I thought I'd, I'd briefly go through a few of my, um, my beliefs, and then you know that when you deal with me in the future, you know what my beliefs are. So the first thing, and the only thing that you need to know me is I'm a massive status quo fan. Once you've, once you've done that, then I've been to see them. I tried to work it out with my wife one day. I've been to see them, I think, 63 times. Um, it might be 65, but we couldn't quite figure it out whether the, um, the two and the... Anyway, so I was also in a punk rock band in the 1970s. Yeah, do you want, what, what we were called? We were called the biologists. <laughs> oh, this, is not a, this is serious stuff, when you're young. We were called the biologists. This is how radical it was. We were called the biologists. You ready for it? Because we all did chemistry. That's not a joke. That's the truth. That's how, that's how bad it was. Um, so I was also, I played rugby at county level. I represented a branch of the Royal Navy at cricket. So if there's ever a sporting event on, you will never get hold of me. I will walk over everybody to get to a sporting event or watch it on the telly. So that's, that's the first thing. That's about me. But the other thing is I do have a very pragmatic streak. Um, I, don't, I don't like big stuff. That's, the think, the first thing. And people have see me um, operate, anybody who um, tries to tell me that they just want to spend more money on something or do something, uh, I always say, mm, what, what do you actually want to achieve from that? So if you're going to deal with me, always tell me what you're going to achieve. I like to think, you're going to spend money, but what's that going to do for people? So that's the first thing. I believe in traditional institutions. I'm a, um, I don't like a big state. I, I've said many times before, and Warren Morgan caught me out. Actually, I, I quoted Friedrich Hayek in council, and he quoted it back because he'd done a degree in philosophy. He knew more about it than I did, so be careful what you say sometimes. But I believe in um, learnt morals and traditions. I think society has evolved. We shouldn't just rush in and kick everything down and break things down and do things. We've got, a, we've got where we are. We've got all you guys here, guys and girls here. Guys is a term you know I can use. It's not sexist anymore to say that, but um, apparently I heard that on the BBC, so it must be true. And um, we all need to find new ways of working. Um, I believe you know the way to do it, but we are, if you like, your your compass out there in the city. We deal with the residents, uh, they come to us, we, they talk to us about stuff, and we are really your customer services, if you like. If something out there is going wrong, uh, we're the ones to come to. So I don't like big stuff, but I do appreciate that the council has to exist and, and you do a good job. Um, I'm a member of the Conservatives, which comes as no surprise to you, um, but I'm more of a, I think I'm more of a, I don't think I am a Conservative, actually. I'm more of a Liberal Tory, I believe in live and let live and um, allow people to do what they like, providing they don't impinge on my life, then just get on with it. Um, for instance, today I've, I've already done my yoga, uh, and if you, if you see me in the summer, you'll be surprised if you ever see me in trousers, because I go around on shorts on my bike everywhere, not exactly a stereotypical Tory. Um, so I don't like big government, uh, and that's where, really where I am. I think that governments are there for a purpose. I think there's a help society, not just to exist in themselves. So how can you help me? Um, interesting question. Uh, I don't know, really. I want you to help me protect the vulnerable. I, I think the, the biggest thing that a council can do is when, um, when society throws up a problem, you can help me protect people. And uh, I don't like big government. I don't like big councils. I don't like big organisations. Um, the City of London, for instance, do you expect me to support it? I don't. I think more of them should have gone to jail for what they did 10 years ago. I'm not a big fan of all this... I like to say they gambled with other people's money. I think a lot of them are criminals. They should have gone to jail. So I'm not. You know, that's the sort of thing. I don't like big stuff suppressing people. Um, so dealing with you, some of you have dealt with me in the past. I'm looking around. You're misfortunate enough. I can see you there, Max. So you know. And the um, and what happens is is that one of the things I don't like is I go to a meeting with, with officers and we sit there and they take. You know, that's yeah, very good, counsel. Yes, that's. That's okay, very good. And then they go, you walk out and go, he's never getting that. He's never going to get that. And um, 
So I think the, um, is what I'd ask for you with me is to be honest. If I come up with some crazy ideas, and I've had a few meetings over the last few weeks, if I come up with some really, really crazy ideas, then tell me. Don't sort of say, yeah, we can, we can do that. Just say that is rubbish. Um, there's a few people here in the room that have told me things are rubbish in the past. Don't smile, Jeff. Um, but there are. Yeah, these two are normally the ones who tell me. But if I do say something absolutely crazy, I expect you to tell me. That's the thing. Just don't let me go off and do, spend six weeks of my life doing something mad. Um, the other thing is, Dan sort of alluded to this, is don't overload politicians. Um, I, I don't know if I should say this in front of these two, but I, was, I occasionally say that out of the 54 councillors, you know, half of them are half mad. It's just your job to find out which half are mad. You know, Because um, it, it, they, can, they can come up with strange decisions, but that's because they work differently. They're not employed by the council. They are elected, um, they're elected to, to represent the council. They are like the governing body. And the one thing I think they... Um, Okay, this is the thing. I can be at home, and I live in Hangleton, so most of my work's up in Hangleton, an old great ward. I don't know if any of you live there, but it's a fantastic place to live. And I can be sitting in my front room, and I get an email from an officer that's saying, I'm just popping to your office, can I see you in five minutes? Well, we don't, most councillors don't work in Hope Town Hall. So when you're trying to get hold of councillors, to think that they sort of work in Barts or here or somewhere, they don't. They tend to either do a job or they work and they come in here only when there's a committee meeting or they have to hold a meeting and specifically that. So that's the first thing I say is try and think of the role that councillors have. They're not officers. They don't come in here at nine o'clock in the morning and leave at five o'clock at night. They don't come in here five days a week. They have a lot of stuff to do in the wards as the, you know, representing their residents. So try and plan with them with, with, office, with officer councillor relationships. I think that's one of the things. And the other thing about me is I don't like long briefings. I always say that most councillors have so much to do, they've got memories like goldfish. If you tell them something after 10 seconds, if you haven't captured their attention, they will forget it. So if you're going to do a briefing, a, a size of A4, any more than that, if, you ha if a council has to turn a page, I'm not speaking for these two, but with me, if you turn a page, then you've almost gone too far for me. Um, give me something nice and succinct, and um, this is what I want, this is what this, and then if I need it, I can then ask you more questions. Uh, being overloaded by this much paper, and I've got all the pages next door, this much paper, and trying to read through it all is just not going to happen. I think the last PR papers, there were 1,020 pages. Not a chance I'm going to read through them all, so. You know, if you're going to, maybe that's the trick. I can see Nigel smiling. The, um, maybe that's the trick. Give me a thousand pages, and I'm only going to read six. But, um, but then decisions come back, and that's when we start to get upset. So I'd say nice short briefings for councillors. Get their attention. If you've got their attention, they'll ask for more. So that's the main thing. Um, the other thing is, I've, is there any lawyers here? Law, yeah, no, I've seen, no, yeah. the, the, the one thing I believe in life is everything is a contract. Now, whether that's a legal contract or a moral contract, I mean, I spoke to Jeff and people here, oh, it's a contract with me being here today. It's a moral contract. I said to Jeff, yeah, I'm going to be there today, and here I am. I don't know why I am sometimes, but um, Jeff, I said, and that is an informal contract. Everything in life are contracts, but in the council, you have to deal with a lot of contracts, which is, well, the first thing I'll say is I'm not a big fan of all this law. I don't know if um, the fact that we send our lawyers up to other authorities and um, ask them to exchange... Uh, expertise and come down here and I'll see, I've said it publicly, I'm going to say it again, I'm not a fan of all this law. I think the lawyers, if, if we're in administration, we're going to be calling on them a lot more because everything in life is a contract you know about contracts, the, um, is, is contractual. Whether it's me talking to you saying I'm going to be somewhere, whether it's I can see Howard there, whether he books a band or something or whatever, life is full of contracts. If you don't get those contracts right then the council will fail it will fail. So we need to get that sort of formal, informal relationship going. So I'm a big fan of, um, of, of that sort of thing. Um, lastly, I'm a big, 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 big fan of behavioural science and the nudge unit. I think that we can, we can sort of encourage people to do things to look after their own lives. And I can see a lot of people around here that have got some great ideas and you've presented me with great ideas in the past about how to get our residents to look after themselves better or maybe something to do with the health service or public health or adult social care or transport, things that we can nudge them into doing the right thing. And I think that's, if we were in administration next time, has Theresa made that deal yet, has she? Okay, maybe we won't be in administration next time, um, but if we are in administration, the one thing I would... The, Am I not giving any clues away here, am I? The one thing I would say, the one thing I would say is that we will encourage people to nudge. I think, uh, that, and that means not telling them what to do, but encourage them that their default situation should do them, do them good. If they just don't do anything and carry on with their lives, they should be directed, sort of nudged towards the right direction. And I think if we were in administration, that's the first thing, first thing we would do. So, um, that's me. That's, 
what I think of you lot. I think you're a good lot. I always used to say, I'll be quick, Jeff. Jeff's giving me the wind up. You know, the um, one thing I would say is I worked in the private industry a lot, and people say, no, oh, you know, you want to go in the council. Honestly, I think the moral um, respect I have for the uh, council is far higher than anybody I've ever met in the private sector. I think you all you are held back by a system that suppresses a lot of your better instincts. And I certainly, if, if we were in administration, I was the leader, I would set you free to do a lot of good work. I think you need to use, take more risks. I think you need to use your imagination. I, I would trust you a lot more. Right? And that's not just saying that, that's my my life. I think um, this thing about public and private sector is a lot of old rot. I think the private sector tends to be slightly more efficient because at the end of it, if you don't sell your product, you go out of business. Whereas you guys here, I think you're suppressed by the system. And I think that's where the ELT here, and I can see Jeff going, I'm going to have a word with you later, young man. Um, I, I just think you need to be set free to, uh, to run the council more, um, more imaginatively. That's me. Any questions, I'm sure you're going to ask them. Thank you.
How, how are you all doing? You want another, another minute or so? Another minute? Are you ready? Or another minute? Another minute. Another minute. Another minute, another minute, okay. Out of time to get some answers. So um, I'm not I'll, whether I can get round every table. I don't know. Um, hello, can I get your attention? Right, because we're going to move on. So um, I'm going to pick some tables randomly and just get you to ask one question from that table. So let's have one over here. One question. Uh, your if you just use your speaker, um, your mic. That one working? Right click. Oh, who wants to look at that? Go on then. And thank you for the question. Is that despite the sort of bravado or despite the things that um, might appear to all of you in the press or indeed today, the way that we're kind of um, joking with each other and so on, is that fundamentally, if we disagreed all the time, we would never not be in a committee. So actually, most of the decisions that are happening most of the time in terms of the day to day running of the council and our focus as you rightly put it, our focus on delivering for residents is that we acknowledge that and that's why only uh, the most controversial decisions, for example, come to the key committees and so on. But I, I, I don't want to speak for the other parties, but I would take it for granted that we very much want to work collaboratively and we see it as key to the relationship, a successful relationship between officers and members, that that collaboration has to continue and it has to deepen. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think, that, I think that's fair. Obviously, I'm I'm a Labour and Cooperative Group member, and, and the Co-op Party, you know, it, it runs runs deep in what I believe. I, I genuinely think that by listening and interacting with the arguments and the difficulties, sometimes you can come up with better decisions. You know, it, one party states don't work. Tony might be surprised that I say that, um, but I'm but I'm not a believer in one party states because I do believe that the city hasn't for 20 years said, okay, you lot go and run it. Yeah, that's right. All they've said is, you 54 people get in a room and sort it out. You know, so so we don't have a strong mandate. Nobody has a strong mandate to say I'm going to do exactly what I want. And we operate a committee structure, which means nobody could ever be in a position as an individual of being able to do that. So we have to work nicely together. You know, playing nicely, working nicely together is just a fundamental of what I believe, but it's also a fundamental of how our constitution makes us work together and how the democratic system has forced us into, into working for the last 20 years. Fingers crossed, some of that continues after May, Obviously, I don't necessarily want there to be minority administration after May, but that's a different thing. And I don't get a choice. I only get one vote. No comment, no comment on that. Um, the first thing, yeah, good question. Huh, thanks, Lisa. The I think the, um, as it, 
Yeah. Some people will know the uh, take joint decision. Yeah, that's okay. We, uh, I, sorry, close your ears. Here, but I, we did a deal with Labour last year on the budget. It went through very nicely. Um, we, we laid our <laughs> red lines, is the word, isn't it? We put our red lines in the sand. We asked that's for some. Backstop. We asked for some. Yeah, thank you. And, um, and we, we, we did a so called deal, but it wasn't. We discussed things behind the scenes. We could agree on most of the spending priorities that Labour put forward. We just wanted some on other things. And we. We went through. The, the thing is that 95% probably we can agree on 100% of where we're going here. I, I spoke about learning morals and institutions, and I think all three of us believe in the institution of the council when we go forward with it. The, the one problem that, and this is a leadership network, the one problem that you lot have is you come to committees and then you see the three parties then rip to shreds a report that you've written carefully over the last six months and... I can see you there, and uh, the um, it, it, it's dispiriting, and that's what I don't like. I, I, I did a, a real job. I don't care if it was a real job; it's a vocation. But I did a real job for years and years, and the, to have senior management come and say, "Right, don't like that. Start again." When you've put a lot of heart and soul into it, is quite dispiriting. So I think that's the one thing that um, officers and councillors need to, to get right: is that don't take papers to, to committees unless you've briefed all the councillors and they're well versed in it and you think you stand a good chance of getting through however there's always going to be that one percent of things that the three of us will never agree on and you just have to put up with it in public which is what most people see we will shout and scream and try to kick each other to death metaphorically and um, that's the way it goes and I have a feeling that it's not going to change over the next few years so sorry about that okay great uh, table right at the back And I'll do one more question after that because we, we are meant to finish around about midday on this session. So we won't, don't lose your questions. Okay. So um, it was uh, prompted by one of your comments, Tony. You talked about freeing us up to be uh, creative uh, in how we deliver the services, which uh, certainly sounded, sounded great to me. But what happens if you don't agree with our creativity? <laughs> <laughs> That, and that is, oh, that's the, that, is a good, that is a really good question because I've just said about bringing papers to committees and for the councils to rip them up and, and that's what you get a lot of times is that some council comes up with a, an idea or they've had a, a, a tradition inside them that they just can't agree to it and they just go mad and it, it's not very dignified to be honest. Um, I indulge in it a little bit and I do apologise if I've ever indulged in any of you like here that maybe gone a bit mad or something or said something crazy but that's the public face of the council but the one thing I think officers need to do in that is take a bit more risk um, but the thing about taking risk is if you go to committee and you take risk you take the risk of also us sort of ripping it apart again but the main thing that I would, would ask <coughs> is that when you take those risks take them to committee get us lot to ensure you against those risks so come up with some imaginative Thing, ways of doing things and certainly the, the my I said I'm a liberal Tory we will support you we will we will go with the risk you know innovative nudges that we give to people or something we will we will ensure you we will indemnify, indemnify you against that that risk but you've got to let us know because we're not the experts we just don't know a lot of the things that are going on so I would say the thing is in future if we were in administration take those risks bring them to us brief all the parties uh, and then hopefully, if it fails, you then don't, somebody then doesn't say to you, you failed in that job. You can say, well, I took it to the politicians and they agreed it, and the, the system has failed. The trouble is, you can have a hundred things where you take big risks. It's the five that fail that everybody will pick you up on. It's not the 95 that are successful. I think we need to embrace the 95 that are successful and not keep picking on people for the 5% that failed. Okay. Phelan, Dan, do you want to say anything on that? Thank you for the question. Um, I disagree with Tony. I think actually at the core of an awful lot of the work that city council officers are doing at the moment, there's an awful lot of creativity. If I think about things like the relationships that we have with some of our partners, so for example, housing colleagues um, have been able to draw up an amazing joint venture with Hyde. For example, that was done over a long period of time and it involved an awful lot of creativity and an awful lot of out-of-the-box thinking um, from people who are used to working in more traditional fashions, but also in terms of some of the stuff, and I'm looking at a number of the key relationships I've had with um, officers in the room in terms of uh, officers showing creativity as it affects the lives of my residents, actually there's not a lot of creativity that's daily borne by what happens in the area that I represent and then what it does to improve the lives 
of the constituents that I represent. Um, I could talk about what the architecture team have done, um, and I'm looking um, at some of the colleagues from architecture in terms of some of the listed features in my ward, how they helped us put together um, a funding bid for government. That, again, was a bit out of their comfort zone. They were, they were very clear about saying that that was a wee bit out of their comfort zone. They did it nonetheless because they knew it uh, was really important for the community that I represent. Um, people like Brian from Adult Social Services, again, he's, he's shown so much innovation in terms of being able to be flexible for residents and so on. I think we, to, to come back to what I was saying earlier about confidence, actually I think an awful lot of people have an awful lot of confidence in you. I would agree with Tony to, the, to some degree that I think we all need to be more innovative, we all need to be more creative as we go forward, but actually I think an awful lot of really good custom and practice is here, and I understand that especially in the context of understanding what's happening in a, in a number of local authorities around the country, where actually that innovation isn't uh, yet bearing fruit in terms of some of the bold decisions that we've made here. I suppose I partly agree with both of them. Um, I've Innovation isn't just about what can you persuade councillors is a good idea to change things. Innovation is about everything that people do. People in, are innovating every day. And I think it's really important not to lose track of the fact that as councillors, we're not there to take every decision that the council takes. We're there to set direction and to take, some, take significant decisions, but we've given up an awful lot of power to officers through delegated authority in order to ensure, A, that we don't get burdened with trying to take all of the decisions, which will be impossible. You know, we can't be here 24-7. Um, and secondly, to make sure that we're not stifling innovation and that we're not getting in the way and that process and governance and, and the bureaucracy of, of having a, a committee system doesn't get in the way of the innovation that you all bring to your work every day. You know, so, so part of my, you know, part of my ask is about trying to discourage ideas needing to come to councillors unless they need to come to councillors. You know, sometimes, especially when there's no, no political control, it is important to be double checking with everybody that everyone's happy. That's right. But that sometimes becomes a, sti a stifling position in itself in that to get us all to agree on something, you kind of have to narrow down the scope, you have to be a little bit less innovative, or you have to find an innovation that we all like. And it's difficult to find innovations that we all like 100%, you know, so, so it, it does, it can be quite stifling in, in an officer role to be able to, to be able to come up with some of that and bring forward some of those really good, really strong ideas. Obviously, once there's majority Labour control come to, um, come May, <laughs> my door will be my door will be open to every innovative idea going. But we're doing it. Let's just let's just let's just remember the benefits of the investments that we've made over the last four years. There has been massive innovation in the way that we deliver services that's helped to deliver us and get us through some of the worst financial restrictions that we've ever been placed under as a city and, and as, a, as a public sector in the city. You know, but more's coming. You know, we need more innovation because actually we know that there isn't going to be so sudden turning on of, of money, or we believe that. Maybe we'll find next year comprehensive spending review that suddenly the taps are turned on, but that's about a Labour government. <laughs> okay, thank you, Dan. Um, we, we've hit the hour when um, we need to let our politicians get away to other things, and we've got to do some other things. I know uh, there were lots of um, quite intense discussions on the table, so let's try and uh, not lose the questions that you've got. But um, what I'd first of all like you to get to do is to thank our uh, three guests this morning for giving up their time, sharing their experiences with us. Thank you very much. And I, actually, I, I'm not just sucking up to them here. It is quite a privilege to be able to work with all of them, all the groups. Um, I think all of ELT and all of you work with them find that um, we can have very good conversations with all three groups. Uh, they do need to differentiate, differentiate themselves politically, um, but I've certainly always found that they're very um, uh, professional in their attitude towards us. Uh, and um, I think they're, they expect from us that we deliver, um, but they're very quick to praise when we do things that are, are well. And we, sometimes we get that in the committees, and sometimes we get that in emails and personal accommodations. But it's a, I, I certainly find it's a real delight to work with them. So thank you very much, councillors.
Okay, we're going to move on to uh, a presentation from Mark and Claire, who are just going to talk us through what we're doing in terms of election planning. All right, we'll just do a bit of a handover on microphone. Jeff, Jeff, just some people grab, grab a coffee. Do you want to just have five minutes? Just yeah. people grab a coffee or so, because it's there. Am I? No? <laughs> Never say anything while the mic's on. Yeah. Abraham's just saying, I've probably said, put in mind people the elections. Yeah. If you, if you vote. So, uh, just please listen. If you'll get, by all means, get seats and coffees for just listening to the presentation from Mark and Claire. So, over to you guys. Okay. Hopefully, it's working, yeah. Yep. Um, member supporting project is what I've been leading on, and the aims. It's really what the three councillors have been saying. I'm glad they're not in the room now. <laughs> because I think we're doing quite a lot of it already. Some of the issues that arose over the last year have been around member security. The little things like car parking, bane of my life, Mark Pryor's going to help me. Me members expect to be able to come and park, and yet they're saying they want to be innovative. So why can't they leave the cars at home and get a bus? But... <laughs> Tony does cycle, but other ones, I don't know. So I'm just going to run through quickly some of this, these bits because I don't like PowerPoints and stuff. But provide councillors with papers. I want all councillors in May to have a hybrid device and not have thousands of paper. Again, that's being innovative. I know 10 councillors aren't going to do that already. 
So how am I going to persuade them? How are we going to persuade them that they don't need those reports? They can use their tablet, they can swipe through and see the papers. They can receive papers electronically and ask questions. So that's what we're hoping for from May, partly because we know we're going to likely to get 22 to 25, 30 new councillors, so they won't know the difference, he says. Um, digital use information, again, what we're looking to do is create a SharePoint site so that all members can have access to it and then bits can go on there. Again, the idea is to save them having loads of emails and different bits coming through that say, look at the latest home issue, look at this issue. They can go there. If we give them training, we're going to put it all onto that site. Again, people have access, so you can be able to put things on. It's all, just to chip in yeah. well, Mark, with that, it's also about um, giving members a resource that they can use when they're out and about, so that yeah. they also can access information, you know, so they've got their hybrid device with them. They don't just have to log down another query. The information might be readily av available for them. And if it isn't, we want to certainly open yeah. up that dialogue with them to say we need this information on a, on a SharePoint site or whatever it turns out to yeah. be. Yeah. But it's all about being able, for them to be able to support their residents in their surgeries or whenever they're just out and about, really. So part of getting added on to that is this I, I case work, which you'll hear being mentioned. We've already got a couple of teams using it as a record management system. We want councillors to have the same so they can use that. And that means they'll log in a request if they're out and about from a resident and they'll send an email in straight in for that to be dealt with by their various directorates, which is why I think it was Fadim said, well, Dan, there's an email addresses now for the various directorates which are going to be managed that so are coming through the iCaseWork system if we can get it working in the next couple of months. But again, that's again trying to help them when they're out and about, having not thinking about coming back in, finding the officer it will come up in our casework and send it direct to them for them. Um, communication, that's an idea for them having... Yeah, in the same way that we do in uh, communications, we do the Your City Council kind of roundup bulletin. We're also looking at um, producing something for members. So again, you know, they, they might not always look at um, the, the Your City Council. They don't maybe see themselves as an employee, but certainly there's some information in there which they need to know about, such as car parking closures, yeah. I don't know, something like that, or, uh, you know, IT advice, you know. So we're looking, we've we're actually started those conversations with members now so that they're actually telling us what sort of information that they would feel useful for, you know, for the SharePoint site and for yeah. that bulletin as well. So again, that SharePoint site, we might even have a map on there so they know where they're going. Again, it's something we're going to do with the induction, is yep. take them round so people yep. get to see who you are, where you are, and they'll have a map so they know where to go. Um, so it's going to... Oh. Is that the same? Communication would give somebody key information. That's your one. Yeah. And then members learning development is key for them. They were saying they're not professionals. They don't know everything. So we will do a self-analysis for them when they get it, once they're in for their learning and development needs. And then we'll be coming to you to help us deliver some of those. Um, we hold the South East Employers Member Development Charter. They've come back to us, we got it again in December, but they've come back to me and challenged me to get Charter Plus. And that means members are going to have to, leaders are going to have to do PDPs with their own members and whether we can get them to change and do that. But in doing it, it means they're going to be coming to you to find out how their members are working across the council, who they're interacting with. Um, so there will be a comprehensive induction program and some activities. Again, they want to come out and site visits. They want to come to the floor. So members have been saying to us they want to actually come out and meet officers where you're working. So again, we need to facilitate that. They're also talking about coming to when we have learning development sessions, joining in with officers. So we might find members turning up. They're going to have access to the learning development site. We're going to identify various courses they should be completing. And partly this is, again, because some of them aren't going to last more than four years. And they want a career. They want to move on. But they need a record. So again, that's what we're hoping to do for them. Um, why is it? <laughs> ah, this is a quick run through for you for the election. So the election is 2nd of May. Counties on the 3rd of May in the Brighton Centre. Councillors actually start on the 7th because of a bank holiday. So all the councillors that aren't elected will finish at midnight on the 6th 
We will switch off their emails. They can go out and party because they won't have to answer any residents' questions. They'll all be redirected to the new councillors. Um, Claire's going to talk about the marketplace in a second. The induction programme for the 13th of May. Again, we've identified some specific sessions they wanted around IT, around security, and they need to know the code of practice, so standards and complaints issues. So Abraham will take them through those. And then... Uh, committee cycles begin 3rd of June. So that's when we have all the new councillors. Again, thinking about it for the member development, what we're hoping to do, and we've written to, I've written to ELT colleagues DMT, is to say, if we've got a housing committee in the afternoon, we want to run a two-hour session on the same day for those housing committee members, and you can take them through a work program for the next four years, give them an idea of what decisions they've got to face, what they're involved in. So we're hoping to get that one put together. Oh, will it go back? That is the picture as it stands, the blanks, all the councillors not standing. So you can see 22 already not standing. An interesting thing from my point of view is you count up the Conservative members who are likely to get back in and fill in the blanks, they're up to 18 already. You only need 27 to have control. So these three councillors here were saying they're going to have a Labour administration. I can't see it being anything other than a minority administration because they're all safe seats, those 18. So if you want to add on some others, you can see where the results are going. Um, I'll move it on because <laughs> I won in 2015. I was out by one in terms of the result. But I won't be this time. I always run a book. <laughs> um, I'll pass over to Claire. Okay, so um, I'm going to go into a bit more kind of practical detail about what will happen on the 7th. Do I need, which one is this one? Uh, oh, there you go. Right, so the 7th of May, all uh, lovely elected new councillors will be invited to... Um, come here to this building um, in the morning. They will uh, come into this room here where uh, probably Jeff will say a few words of congratulation, explain to them a bit more about how this day will work. Um, they will then go off into um, sort of four rooms from here which they'll do kind of a number of admin to uh, tasks, sort of um, return of acceptance, acceptance forms, um, their photos, which we need to make sure um, are done quite quickly because they'll need to go onto the website. Practical stuff around ID passes. Really importantly, I think, is that um, skills audit and uh, kind of just awareness, understanding. We've, that's that's going to be crucial in terms of building really bespoke kind of induction training development plans for them because there is the kind of the mandatory stuff around this is your IT, this is the governance, this is where everything sits. But actually, we really want councillors to be... Um, really comfortable to say, I don't understand how a budget works and I really need to know exactly where, the, where all the money comes from, how it, you know, where it all goes. So we're really encouraging councillors as part of that kind of, you know, go into a room and tell us what you want to know so we can put that together. You know, there'll, there'll be obviously commonalities between it, but also if there is a particular need for somebody, we need to be able to cater for that as well. So while all that's happening out there, oh yeah, we should also say that um, in terms of sort of Dan's kind of, you know, who do I go to, each new councillor will be given um, an ELT buddy as well. So all of ELT will be in a room waiting to be introduced to their new councillors. And that's their kind of initial kind of who do I go to in that first kind of three or four weeks. So hopefully it should mean that they're going to ELT rather than straight out to you guys. And then obviously they'll be using casework, I casework. So while all that's happening out there, then in here what will be happening is a, and hopefully you should know something about this already because we've started work on it already, which is each directorate is going to have, rather than um, we thought, and taking feedback from the Members Development Working Group, wasn't it, they felt the induction before was very much kind of being talked at for hours on end, it was too much too soon, they really didn't. You know, it, it was just too intense. So what we thought on this first kind of session is make it a bit more interactive, hopefully a bit more fun, use it as a bit more of a kind of a networking event, really. So 
as I said, while they're out there doing all of that admin stuff, project teams from each directorate will be assembling uh, a kind of display stand. We're calling it kind of like a marketplace event. And it's really the council's opportunity to meet all of you guys, your teams, to hear about your services, but in a really informal, interactive way. So let's get onto a picture. Here you go. Hang on a minute. We've, oh, yeah, we should say something about each director has got a uh, budget of £2,000 for their particular kind of uh, marketplace event stand. So some of that money is going to this bit of kit here. So to try and make it a little bit kind of consistent in how it looks, we don't want it to be kind of too higgledy-piggledy. Every director has this as their basic bit of kit. And we came down yesterday and uh, set it up for the first time just to kind of see sizing. And we're, trying, we're working now on a kind of a layout, a kind of a footfall. So again, we're going to have a kind of a, a buffet lunch. And the, the stands are going to basically go all along this side over to here. And it's really, it is that kind of marketplace event. You want members, new members, to come and talk to you. So you've, hopefully, the project teams that you've put together with a communications lead as well be kind of really encouraging you to kind of make your stand a draw and interest. Um, we've even had a suggestion yesterday. One of the comms team, in all seriousness, wanted to bring a sheep in here to uh, talk about the park rangers and what they do. I mean, it's getting, you know, it's that kind of, you know, we've, we've got uh, another member, uh, Gin, wanting to get all the members basically a little bit squiffy on, on local produce of gin. I mean, this might be an idea if it's going badly. But uh, so this, we're working, our design team will be working with you as well on that commonality of look and feel, but it's really up to the project teams to, to be selling, introducing. This isn't a time for bogging everyone down in kind of the challenges, the hardness. This is about who we are, how you contact us, and also what we've done really well and what, you know, how we will continue to work with you. Um, so that's the marketplace event that will go on for a couple of hours. As I said, there'll be lunch. It's a really informal networking event, and hopefully you're involved in terms of the project teams that have been put together in the directorates. Um, if you're not and you want to be involved, then I am hold. I basically have fortnightly meetings, which uh, Mark comes along to, just to make sure ideas aren't too crazy and that people are thinking about it seriously. And ideas like sheep can be reined in. So. Um, I think that's it for that bit of it, isn't it? Oh, there we go. Okay. We can talk a bit more about general induction, about what happens next. I mean, there, as I said, there will be those kind of, uh, not mandatory because we can't enforce anything, but those kind of, in the next week, there'll be a particular steer on IT as well, real push on IT, depending on the hybrid devices that we get. And as Mark has said about the tour that we want to do, we'll be asking you to basically be in certain places at a certain time so that when we do bring the members around, we can introduce you that way as well. Okay. Yeah, Abram. Um, Abram, I think you might need the mic as well. Yeah, just, just to say that well, I'm, I'm not going to go into detail, but we would like the, uh, the arrangements in terms of supporting members to be uh, as, uh, as, uh, as good as possible, especially for the new members. And the particular area that they have more concern is about the um, digital set of agendas. Our intention is from the 3rd of uh, May, uh, new members would not be given paper copies. And that assumes that when you write reports, you have to write it assuming that it will, it will be digitally read on a screen. For example, the use of spreadsheets on other ones which are difficult to navigate on a screen as far as possible, we should avoid them. We'll try to give you some guidance to make that happen. The second bit, which is probably um, important to emphasize, is that one of the existing protocols we have for response times for members is important. And I would probably might need to have to recycle that. So to create a good impression with the new members, that's something that if we could uh, uh, sort of adhere to that as soon as uh, sort of immediately from the uh, 2nd of May, that would probably create a good impression with our new members. That's all I want to say. Yeah. Yeah. So just on that, does that mean we'll be able to use kind of interactive digital content, um, like if you're hovering over a pie chart and you want to look at the numbers for one bit? 
Um, it'd be good to explore that a bit because that would be a nice way to visually present things in, in quite a simple way, whereas when things have been printed, you've had to do a lot of, lot of text to explain that or a static chart. Yeah. Oh, yes, I, I think that's right. Doing it digital opens up those options, but there are, as Mark said, there are probably a, a residual growth of about five to ten members who are never going to go to a digital. So we, th those ones, we may have to say, if you want the digital, it's available there, but we won't be able to replicate all of all of that in on paper. But what you're suggesting is, is the advantage of doing deep going digital. Thank you. Yeah. Quill pens and copper plate writing for everyone else. That's right for those ten. Any, anybody else got sort of immediate questions? Otherwise, I was going to just give you a little bit of time to have a chat at your tables and then um, come back with any questions that have emerged out of that. Anybody got anything immediate? No? Okay. So just have, uh, how long have we said? I, I think maybe, what do you think, about 10 minutes? 10 minutes fine for everyone? Okay, and then we'll just open up to have a bit of a group discussion. And grab, grab another tea or coffee if you want one.
Okay. Okay, everyone, we've got uh, roughly 20 minutes to uh, have a bit of a collective discussion. Um, so maybe if I just sort of randomly go around again uh, and just get you to say a little bit about, you know, a couple of points of the things that were coming out for you. So maybe start this table at the front. Yeah, use the mics. So I think that's a good idea, Emma. Switch it on. Uh, try another one. Okay. Um, quite a few different things um, uh, the top of the list because I was scribing so I got to put it um, opportunity for lived experience opportunity, opportunities for me individuals with lived experience so um, obviously from the community and politics perspective taking all the stuff that they hear that's um, data that's policy but then actually having opportunities where they can go out and meet residents um, from whatever particular dimension of their lives so that it actually puts them a reality behind it all because not all of them obviously come into contact with the diversity of citizens that live in our city um, so that's something that certainly my team will be interested in and if we want to work with any others from any other service areas where it's system related our social care for example then we'd be happy to do that um, look at all the manifestos so I think as a management team it's our responsibility to read all the manifestos and think about how they relate to um, our areas of work and to be on top of it. So um, particularly everyone was agreement is like hit the ground running. So we know we've read the manifestos, we've thought about how they might apply to our area. And because we're in a committee system, obviously the leaders said we must think about how it relates all across all of them, despite the fact that there obviously will be an administration and potentially it will be a minority one anyway, Mark said. <laughs> and there was a conversation about whether we wanted to do something around the pre-meet in June, July. So rather than bombard them necessarily with lots of information just before the committee meeting and they're about to go into decision making, whether there's something you could do with the, around that pre-meet a couple of weeks ahead of them. Um, and then also um, uh, keep it simple, stupid rule um, in terms of how we write our reports or anything that we're going to produce. You know, they don't have that background, they don't have that professional knowledge, um, so just really keep it simple and then potentially layer that up as we go. Great, thanks so much. Is that all right? Anybody else from that group? Okay, let's do that group right in the top corner. So I'm losing my voice, so hopefully you can hear me. Um, firstly, we just acknowledge that this is quite a complex process, so induction is not going to happen immediately and support for the new administration. And, and helping new members to um, get up to speed will take time and we just need to think about how we do that. We thought that we need to start planning those two hour sessions that will take place before each committee now and start thinking about that content. Two hours will go quickly and we probably will need to focus on the forward plan or the, or the critical path that we're doing with policy so that we can take members through the things that are coming forward. But what that won't do is give them the detail that lies behind each of our services, so we will need to think about how we do that. In terms of how we can bring members up to speed more on the detail, we felt that the buddy system is a good idea, um, but it may need to be distributed um, carefully but across the leadership network so that we're able to um, help members to understand um, some of the detail. And then finally, in terms of the marketplace, just for me, I, I love our sheep. I think they're fantastic. <laughs> but I, I'm not very good with animals, so sorry, Claire, no to uh, sheep being in the marketplace. Anybody else from that group? Okay, thanks, Nick. I've just got one be, question. Just to reassure Nick, we've discussed the sheep, there's not going to be sheep, there's tigers Uh, there was some reservation about the pre-committee thing. People felt that if you have a member sort of training two hours and then to go into a very long housing committee meeting, that may not work. So the suggestion from here was, would it be better to use the, the committee pre-meet, invite other members? So that, that was a suggestion that came from our table. Okay, so I think we're capturing these points as we go. Let's go to the table in the corner. 
All right, try not to repeat things which have been touched on already. Three key things. We felt that, irrespective, there's going to be a lot of new councillors who don't know what they're doing when they first start. And so we do like the budding programme idea. We wondered whether there was some suggestion we could put to the groups that actually they find councillor buddies as well. So experienced councillors within their group that they could, uh, they could buddy with also. Um, and probably possibly a role for the leader, to, the leaders of each group to be a bit stronger. So if there are a few councillors who say we're not going to go digital, we want it by paper. And actually, that's not how it's going to operate. Well, could we have entities on pushback say this is how it's going to be, it is paperless for these reasons. And, so, and leaders to actually take a command of their own groups and say that's the, the new discipline for the future. If anybody does choose to have it been by printed uh, format after that, then they're getting sent to home, they can print off on their, on their own computers or with their own paper. So to be a bit firmer on that one. Um, secondly, was we're wondering about the expectation the relationship between councillors and officers and where councillors come into and being really clear as to where that is from the outset. That's not wanting to be hierarchical and controlling as such, but it is about also protecting our staff as well. So, you know, new councillors, they come in at director or, or assistant director level or service manager level, and then we can signpost where to go to for the responses. So I think that was quite important. And the other one was a six-month programme. So actually, the first, it won't be all on March 7th, though that event looks really, really good, but we need to spend probably six to nine month programme of working with councillors to get them up to speed. And the final one, and I, before I say this, this was a collective responsibility at this table before I get my head cut off by Claire or Mark. Um, but I got nervous at the idea of doing joint training with members, and it was something which was shared on the table as well, because I just think it changed the dynamic of, that, of how people could interact in that training venue. And so I just asked that we give some considerations to whether, that would, whether that's a good idea or not. Thank you. Let's do this middle table. So I'll start with one that kind of linked with what Rob just said. We thought it would be timely to dust off the conduct for members and officers relations to protect staff and councillors and so kind of raise the awareness of that. We also had some practical questions and I suppose what, what we could do is understand better about how, how I case work is going to work and um, training around that as well. We thought it might be useful for DMTs to decide lists of officer contacts for key issues kind of ahead of the election so we're kind of ready to go and also distribute them within our teams as well so they know how we're kind of dealing with councillors when the new team coming in. There was a suggestion around ensuring that councillors are offered training on GDPR so it will help them understand what they can and can't get access to um, and we can also brief our teams following today and post-election on portfolios of the new councillors and their likely priorities as well. So, okay. Thank you. Anybody else from that table? No? Okay, let's do this table down here. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I need to switch. Okay. We, um, there was a suggestion that um, following the kind of marketplace event that we then do a kind of follow-up with members to say six months later, not at kind of the same event, but kind of do another kind of en masse event to, to basically gather information about what was useful, what was working well. And I think that will be part of that kind of rolling, as you said, Rob, over there, that kind of rolling programme of induction. That should be part of it. So. Okay. Anybody else yeah. on the table? Okay, let's do uh, this table here. Uh, we had <clears throat> quite a long conversation about the IT stuff and how we support members to use the new devices they're getting and we were talking about maybe councillors budding up with each other, supporting each other with the new technology, thinking about how we make sure they get real VIP treatment through ICT um, and how we might um, sort of organise kind of one-to-one -one support with them and support for digital um, and doing as much of the kind of nudge as possible because um, we talked about actually how do you get all councillors onto it and is there a point where you can um, switch off the paper stuff but um, doing as much encouraging as possible. And then we had a conversation about how um, this came from Dodo running the working with members courses and how uh, some of our staff or teams don't necessarily understand the role of councillors 
um, and the need to be responsive and so on. And we talked about our role as leaders, about how we um, support our teams to understand that. And then we also had a conversation about planning what happens after the marketplace. So I think there's going to be quite a big hit of information and then how each team sort of plans through what's needed after that. I think that's the mm -hmm. interest of course. Oh, and it was the course that Rachel devised that Dodo now runs. Right. <laughs> Working okay. with members. Excellent. Really good course. If you okay. <laughs> sorry to make sure Rachel gets yeah, a good Shout there. out. <laughs> Shout out to Rachel. Is she on commission? <laughs> okay, let's do this table over here. Let's find another one. I got it. Yeah, yeah, got it. Um, we said a lot of what's been said already, actually. We said the induction was quite a key one in terms of it being a process over time rather than here's the information, you know everything. It's going to be key about un understanding for members who they go to, particularly. And we also outlined the distinction, particularly between lead councillors as well, as you know, in committees, wanting probably a portfolio as well of certain information. Um, we also mentioned a lot about there's going to be established councillors as well as new councillors. So we've built a lot of relationships with the existing councillors that come and we have to ensure there's no bias there in terms of they know a lot already and that's not between political parties, that's across parties. So we're going to have to be really careful, I think, on how we support new councillors in particular. Um, we also mentioned about clear definition uh, of where member decision making starts and stops. Being very practical about that, I think, as well. I think that's quite key. Um, to support that, the relationships. Um, I think that's about it, really. Is there anything? Else? Oh, there's the two rules of thumb we've added as well the brevity to start and to get the relationships right as well. Yeah, great. Anybody else from that table? Okay, thank you very much. Go to the top table over there. Um, so, again, a lot of the uh, points raised we agree with, particularly around um, making sure that all officers are trained and understand the different roles. Um, and particularly when we have new councillors, it's really important as officers that we're quite solid in knowing what is a councillor responsibility and what's an officer responsibility, because some of our experience is that new councillors sometimes feel that they need to get too involved in the detail and also that there's tensions between managing the tensions between their um, strategic decision-making role and advocacy role for um, individual constituents. So that training, we think, for officers is as important as it is for members. Um, another point, I've got two other sort of main points. One is about um, the training for members, and we were questioning why some training isn't mandatory, and the things that we were thinking about, particularly around um, information security, financial probity and equalities um, training in the public sector equality duty and I know in the past that's because um, there's been a member decision that it isn't mandatory but actually they've got a lot of responsibility they're running a risk personally um, as well as for the organisation if they're not clear about what their responsibilities and when we think about it in the context of global HPO as the leaders as well I think it's very disappointing that that training isn't um, mandatory for for councils, but I know that that's complex, but it would be good to understand why not a bit more. And then the other one is um, taking the opportunity of going onto the digital platform to reset the amount of information. So what, what we were saying is it wouldn't be good to replicate the, the level of um, bureaucracy that we're involved in and whether or not that is an opportunity that we can reset that amount, uh, the amount of information. What we don't want to do is just keep producing more reports. And is there a wider opportunity with the new administration to look at have we got too many committees? Is the way we service those committees using up so much resource that actually it's not, we're not putting that resource into value work to actually deliver services? But we did acknowledge that democracy, you know, we do work in a democracy. It's important to get that balance right. Okay, so a question. Anybody else at the table want to add? I thought, I thought the point on the mandatory training, um, Mark mentioned earlier that um, if we go to the new charter, and they have to have PDPs, then there may be a way in which we can reintroduce the mandatory element. But anyway, let's, uh, but there's a working group that's picking all of this up, so uh, all of those ideas are really good. Last table. that actually have 
haven't really engaged in yeah. the last uh, in this one um, and having a buddy for all everyone would be good um, that we have to aware, be aware that they are elected because they want to make change they see their communities they think they can improve it they might not understand how but if they come in and we just say no 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 actually we've lost them so it is about understanding how we support them in that change but also conversely they will have been knocking on doors uh, saying to people, yep, vote for me, we can do that, vote for me, we can do that. So we need to be clear, we can't sort the NHS out, we can't, uh, we can't stop Brexit. Um, I've said before in another council, uh, they came in on their first day and said we want to close the Channel Tunnel, and we told them they couldn't do it. Um, so they will have things that we just think are barking, um, but make sure that when we do our marketplace, we don't perpetuate that by being so keen for them to have a good impression of us and us selling our services that we end up saying yes to things that when we leave the room, and that's what Councillor Janio said, we go, yeah, 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 don't be stupid, we're not doing that, because they will remember us saying yes. So it's about getting that balance between letting them do what they want to do because they are the, the council and not making them think that money isn't an option. Because I think some of them, we thought some of them come in thinking that it's us that's stopping them doing things, when really it's Dave with the money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we will all do everything. Well, point well made, Larissa. <laughs> but we need to get them that it isn't us that, that is stopping it. There are lots of things. Some of them's the law. And um, I think on our marketplace with Joe, we are seeing your uh, sheep and we are raising you counterfeit tobacco and alcohol. So uh, just saying, come to our stall because we're the team that delivers. Brilliant. Yep, short day. Um, it's actually Nigel, not me, who stops <laughs> There was a really good point somebody made here, which I think would probably benefit a lot of people in this, a lot of officers as well as um, councillors. And it's kind of some sort of potted history of what decisions have happened and, and kind of why the, why the city is the way it is. Because if you don't have that some sort of backstory, a lot of things are very, very confusing. I mean, I've been a resident for eight years before I started working here, but I didn't really understand a lot of what, what happened and that might help particularly the new ones yep. brave person who writes that though um, <laughs> probably end up being me um, ok look that's brilliant the, the collective mind is um, outstanding as always um, in getting all of your ideas down so for the people particularly Claire, Mark and Abraham and the team um, really really helpful to get your collective thoughts um, always opportunities to continue to feed in um, so if other ideas come up please uh, shout uh, and also um, we, we put out for involvement in the election um, I mean there aren't endless numbers of roles but certainly I think for the for us as the management the leadership network early engagement particularly with new councillors who've been elected really really important so if you are able to get involved in, in the election process itself you not only meet the candidates but you'll also meet the, uh, the, the ones who've been successfully elected um, so thank you very much for all your uh, contributions so a little bit about um, just to close off uh, next session is going to be on financial year uh, we're going to be in the next financial year and we're going to be talking a bit more about um, our workforce uh, being a fair and inclusive place to work so um, you'll be aware of some of the announcements and some of the discussions we've been having um, the work that we've been doing with global HPO uh, a bit of a, a bit about the work that we've been doing on the people promise and where do we develop that further um, we've also said that we're going to do a pay review um, I mean that is not without some challenge um, but there are issues which are propelling us to have to try and address that um, but there'll be other things that um, will come to your minds as well um, I think we know that our trade union environment can be incredibly challenging um, and we're going to be doing some work, um, I hope, with both ACAS and the Local Government Association um, to deal with some of the issues around what does it mean to be both, uh, what, is it, what does our, our employer, the 54 councillors, think it means to be a good employer? What do we think it means to be a good employer? I like to think we can have a discussion with our trade unions about what do they think is good industrial relations. 
but also what do we think is good industrial relations, what does our employer think is good industrial relations, um, so that we can begin to deal with some really quite thorny and ingrained issues in the organization, which sometimes um, can be a terrific benefit that we have strong trade unions, but also um, can be quite challenging when, when relationships between us all become dysfunctional. Um, so, so an interesting discussion ahead of us, I think, next financial year. Um, as always, I'd just really like to thank all of you for um, the time and effort that you put into coming here. It's really good to see that we get a really strong attendance. I think it's a real sense that um, it's very important that we work together collaboratively um, and that we get to understand each other's areas. Uh, one of the things that I think came out for me, uh, stuck in my mind from some of the comments that Council has made, uh, the opportunities to work across each other's areas um, is something which I'm very keen to explore as we go forward because um, one of the things about silo working is because we're just used to working in one organisation, one discipline. But as senior managers, we can bring those skills and experiences and use them in different bits of the organisation. So whether it's um, formal secondments or whether we can do some stuff where you can um, do some knowledge transfer and develop your managerial skills by working in different places. Um, I, I certainly think that's an opportunity, and I know just looking at uh, Rachel and one or two other people uh, who are having that experience in City Clean, never having worked there before, um, it's, it's a really, really good uh, experience to have in terms of developing your career and your confidence to be able to work in all sorts of different environments. So just before I end, is there any other business that anyone wants to raise, any questions, concerns? things that are troubling you from what you've heard today or just generally that you want to share with colleagues? No? Then see you soon. Enjoy lunch. Bye.